for, I get to the same place you do, but I get there for a different reason. And I think if you look at the DSM-4 versus the DSM-5, um, you can look at it and they've really, particularly for Criteria 2, they've really expanded it to like be open to non-binary people. And there's a trend in psychotherapy um, diagnosis where they will um, basically expand a category and in expanding it, they make it less useful because it's very hard to get treatment. Yeah. And I think with trans people and non-binary people, I know non-binary people, they're going through something real and they deserve respect and they deserve public policy answers, even though it's so under-researched. I think they're experiencing something though that is very different than what say binary trans women are, are going through. And I think separating that in the DSM, like we're seeing the CAST report come out today, and a lot of that is because these two terms, non-binary and, and binary trans, are being conflated when it comes to the medical treatment. So it would be very helpful to separate this. It's not because I want non-binary people treated with less dignity. It's because I think it would get it would be good for them to get the research that they need to figure out what the good course of action looks like for them. And we could kind of have um, you know, the health needs for binary trans people be a lot more specific and unpolluted with these other data sets. <laughs> It's time to scream at Brianna Wu. Let's go. Let's go. You're going to yell at Brianna Wu. Oh, my we're, goodness. We're yelling at Brianna Wu. It's happening. Let's do it. Let's How are you doing? Is this the first time we've spoken? Have we done a panel together? Uh, it's possible. I have, like, Swiss cheese for brains, so I honestly never remember. <laughs> so it's possible. It's possible. We might have before, but I'm not 100% sure. Well, well, I've loved your uh, Zenny and Poppy uh, coverage. It was, uh, you know, I reached out to you after I saw you on Chud. Um, just, oh my God, stunning, stunning stuff. Oh my gosh. That's quite the interesting ride for sure. <laughs> what makes you like interested in trans drama? Like, I can't think of anything more depressing to do professionally than trans drama. I love drama. I just love it. It's, you know, you uh, when I was little, you know, we were always watching uh, Tila Tequila, always watching Rock of Love, I Love New York, all that shit. So now that I'm older, I'm like, wow, like there's an infinite pool of this drama on the internet for free. I don't even have to pay for a subscription service. You know what I mean? Yeah, but trans drama, I mean, at least political drama, it's, I don't know. I think that's, that's what I found so interesting about your comments earlier in the stream. You're like, I would never, ever touch something as disgusting as political drama. And you're, you're talking about trans drama, which is the, that's the sewer of drama. That's the lowest it's, level of exactly. it. Exactly. It's grimy. It's dirty. It's disgusting. It's juicy. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. That's what I like. <laughs> you're here for the, you love the sick stuff. That's what I'm here for. Exactly. Oh my gosh. All right. What's your problem with me? Let's get to it. Oh what's my God. On? Where are we going to start? Okay. Um, I... So something that I saw, so you mentioned the difference between the DSM-4 criteria and the DSM-5 criteria, specifically with Ooh. criteria two. two. Um, I heard you talking about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, something that I have always uh, maintained is that the DSM-5 criteria is significantly better because the DSM-4 criteria was more like, if you're a cross-dresser, uh, this works really well for you. Um, the DSM-5 that's criteria- that's one, of the, that's one of the six things is about cross, uh, cross-dress. That's Well, one so the, the five, yeah. the five or the instances that Hold they're on. the other Let me pull this up. Oh. Oh. Debate it. Let's go debate, bro. Hang Let's on, do I gotcha. it. Okay. I have them. Do you want me to send them to you? I have them both right in front of me. I, I was looking at this before the panel. I happened okay. to have it on my phone. I was uh, talking Perfect. to Kyla about the cash report. So, all right. Let's do it. All right. So, the DSM 4, the 5 are 1 repeatedly stated desire to be or insist that he or she is the other sex Two in mm -hmm. boys preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire and girls insistence on wearing stereotypical masculine clothing three a strong and persistent preference for cross-sex roles and make-believe play fantasies or being of the other sex Four, intense desire to participate in the stereotypical games or pastimes of the other sex in five a strong preference for playmates of the other sex so i would say that this is a lot more this of is like for children this is for yeah. children the, yep. is the adult one not like exactly the, the adult same? one is not the same it oh my is, god uh, i yeah. have to kill myself how embarrassing hang on <laughs> uh, killing myself killing myself killing myself okay there we go okay so this is okay this one's for children just kidding if i just scroll down <laughs> kill me okay so uh da -da -da. It is desire to be the other sex, frequent passing, desire to live is the other sex, conviction of the feelings, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. 
be persistent discomfort. Big with the difference there between sex. cross-dressing and living as the other sex, right? Mm -hmm. And then this one is disturbance uh, without intersex condition, disturbances that cause clinically significant, and then conduct yep. based on age. So with the, the DSM-5 uh, criteria, what is, what is the thing that you don't like about the DSM-5 criteria? Well, it's so uh, let me be really specific and it's clear to me you you really know this stuff so you can understand this right so one of the things that happens sometimes is as we get new studies you tack more and more stuff onto something in a way that makes it less clinically uh valid so my my core goal here is I want binary trans people to get the best healthcare possible, and I want non-binary people to get the very, very best healthcare possible. Um, and I think if you're non-binary, something you should be really upset about is the fact that there are very, very few studies that have been done that specifically focus on what non-binary people need and what the um, what the clinical intervention is that will allow that um, discomfort to um, to go away. Go look at the W path right now. Non-binary is about two or three pages of it, and it just comes down to find a gender role that works. So my problem is, if you look at the changes in the DSM-5 here, it's essentially watering down all of these things and saying, or wanting another gender role that existed, right? What I think makes most the most sense here is to separate this uh, between non-binary and binary trans people, because I think these are two different outcomes that you're going for. And I'm not trying to say one is better than the other, I'm not trying to say one is m less valid, I'm saying the clinical pathology for these two things does seem to be different. And I think that would lead everyone to have the, the healthcare that they need. Um, I, I think it would be a more clear path for people to get the healthcare that they need. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so I don't necessarily disagree because I think that it's a fair criticism that the the medical like schema that exists now is very binary in nature, where like if you are a non-binary person, the expectation is that you transition orthodoxly in one direction or the other. Like those are kind of your options, right? It's either testosterone mm -hmm. or estrogen. There's not really a lot of wiggle room within that. That's right. So I think that that's a fair criticism. The, the only thing that I would say is that like because of – so I agree that there should be like more avenues of care for people like this. Um, obviously with trans men, I'm a little bit more familiar because that's kind of like my wheelhouse. Um, mm -hmm. Something that I know is that like uh, n uh, nullification and neurosis or nitrosis is something that's like very popular in FTM spaces. Um, for, I'm sorry, like, nullification? What does this uh, So what nullification is, this is like basically removing all gendered aspects of your body. So this would be like the ultimate androgyny like kind of process. So uh, for bottom it surgeries. It's non-binary. Yeah. yeah. So for bottom surgery specifically, you basically just have a pee hole. Uh, you don't get nipples when you get top surgery, things like that. You basically like degender your body through surgical means and then you kind of you know balance the hormones in a way that achieves that perfect androgyny if you would like the perfect non non-binary person if we had to pull up a textbook so um, in FTM spaces this is something that I've seen um, pretty commonly um, more common than you would think obviously not very popular but still something that I've seen um, but because right now the way that it's aggregated I think that it's fair um, that this criteria would as of right now, would include non-binary people only because they're still accessing the same resources and kind of going through the same processes that binary trans people do. Obviously, I agree these are different experiences. We have different, you know, uh, gendered expectations or not expectations like gender goals, um, transition goals, things like that. Our healthcare is going to be a little bit more driven in one direction, maybe not as, you know, in the middle. Um, but I think that like by by virtue of where we are right now, the way that this criteria sets out actually works pretty well because then non-binary people can still get access to medical transition without having to do like the forced, like I am truly diametric diametrically like right in the middle because we know they can kind of vary one way or the other. Exactly. No, I think we're getting to the exact same place. So what is our disagreement here? I don't, I truly don't understand. My only disagreement is that like, I don't think that like the quote unquote watering down of the DSM-5 criteria, something that has been said is that it kind of like disaggregates the data sets, um, even though that we know that non-binary people consume these resources in the exact same way that binary trans people do. I don't know if there's really an argument to be made that it's like disaggregating the resources. The only thing I could say, see is like, if you have non-binary people that mark that they're dissatisfied with their medical transition because maybe they went too far in one direction or the other, um, I could see how that could kind of skew that, but I don't really see the the issue i would say as of right now where non-binary is kind of uh this criteria expanded uh, a bit. here is here is the disconnect okay so let me see if i can voice this and see if we can come to uh at least friendly disagreement on this so do you think there are 
there is a non-trivial number of people that might believe they have gender dysphoria but would not be served by transitioning. Would you agree with me that's a, a non-trivial number? Well, can you give me like a number that you're thinking of? Because I agree no, that just there's... Just a, a greater than not important, right? Like 5%, let's say, 2%, right? Yeah, I can agree with that. I'm sure that there's a decent amount of people where medical transition isn't necessarily what's best for them. Sure. Yeah. So with the DSM-4, one of the things it very specifically said, um, uh, we can look at this and verify it, but um, it, 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 this may have actually been the DSM-3, but it was saying um, ex ex really explicitly for children that this desire was not out of a frustration of the perceived advantages that the other um, sex might have, right? So if you had like that um, social frustration with uh, you know, typical stereotypical gender roles, that very, very like specifically uh, screens you out of this, right? So I think that uh, something that makes it really tricky is we want non-binary people to have access to health care that they need. Um, it's very clear that we don't have the research to kind of delineate what, what does that mean, what are the criteria, when does someone like need medical intervention as someone that's non-binary versus someone that um, you might be going through a phase. Uh, we don't have a really clear diagnostic way of screening those people out right now. So I think that um, because those situations under these criteria are inherently less clear, I just think that, you know, parents, clinicians for minors just need to be more aware of this because symptomology like drives um, clinical intervention, if that makes sense. Yeah. So my thing would be so like taking children out of the equation, because I don't agree with surgical intervention with children by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I enjoy um, a lot of the changes that are being done um, in Europe where they're kind of rolling back and saying this can kind of be like a last resort. I kind of agree with that. But <clears throat> So when we think about like the diagnostic criteria and kind of the, I guess we could use like, I don't want to say the word viability, but like how, how beneficial this is going to be for you, right? So like if we say that there's like a non-negligible amount of people where medical transition would not serve them best, um, therefore uh, it's important to kind of, you know, make sure that we're filtering this out appropriately so that people are getting access to what they need while also making sure that people are making mistakes and so on and so forth. Um, my question right. is why would this only, so when I think about psychiatric interventions as a whole, um, the mm -hmm. effectiveness of most psychiatric interventions are going to be very low, right? So antidepressants have uh, like a success rate of about 70%. But if you go to the doctor, and you say I'm depressed, the first thing they're going to talk to you about is going on antidepressants. And so my concern would be that we're holding this to a very ultra high rigid standard just because it happens to be trans people. And I can agree that the interventions are like a little bit more severe, right? Like you're not getting surgery or things like this for a simple antidepressant, of course. Um, but when we think about something like hormones or somebody kind of figuring out if they want to be on hormones, maybe we put them on a little bit of hormones for a little bit. And if they like it, they can keep going or they can stop. In the context of adults, my question would be, why is the number of, you know, five to, what do we say, like five to 2%, why does that number dictate our ability to expand the diagnostic criteria? But when we talk about putting people on antidepressants, the margin is like 40%. It's a fantastic question. I wish we could get to a world where the um, political viability of treatment played no role and it was 100% like uh, psychiatric clinician driven. I would do anything to get to that world and I fully agree with your point. We don't live in that world. And the political reality that I think a lot of people are not seeing is access to every single part of this is under political assault. Republicans have bills uh, on the deck to eliminate this across the board. And I think if Trump is elected, I think there's a very, very good chance we're going to see uh, adult access to care uh, um, taken away. So given that political reality, um, you're right to say this is a double standard because it is, but it's still a political reality and we can't just put our heads in the sand. We, we need an answer for that. And every single you know person that should not have transitioned that gets through this screening process, um, you know, that is a political problem. So um, does that make sense to you? Like my highest mission here is making sure everyone has access to um, healthcare.
It makes sense to me. I guess I would just come at it from a different perspective where I would say that like the viability and like the necessity of interventions that people need um, isn't really going to be contingent on the optical presence of like how good that looks to people. Because if I sat down and, you know, I explained uh, the process of a total hip replacement and I said that this has, you know, like a 40% regret rate or like a 30% 30% failure rate and you're going to have to get it replaced within 10 years. People would look at you like you were fucking insane. Like we shouldn't be doing this to people. We live this in that barbaric, fucking right? world. We don't. We can mm-hmm. want that world, but we don't live there, man. We don't. We don't. That is true. We don't. But I also don't think that we should have to concede entirely that this needs to be like a 100% textbook proven. And what's like, your answer? What's my, your answer? What do you want to do? Like and pretend this isn't real? Like just No, I think that we can yeah. still engage with it like substantially and, and kind of argue it in the way that we're arguing it right now, where I can look at a host of interventions where I can say, you know, there are people that are going are gonna to regret this intervention and there are risks associated with it. And sure, I agree there should be uh, certain parameters around people accessing this, especially when we're talking about children. But in the grand scheme of things, in like especially in the, the political arena, I think it comes down to the idea that like people are adults and should be able to do what they want to do. And I think that we can appeal to that sensibility, at least from the conservative side of things, where we say, you guys really love the idea of personal freedoms. Why don't we just extend that to medical decisions as well? Because the same way that you don't want to force grandma to get chemo, you know, when she's 97 years old and she's going to die sad and alone and in pain, the same way that I don't want your hand in my medical decisions as well, right? I hear that argument. Ultimately, you were talking about spreading awareness. The trans community has plenty of goddamn spreading awareness. What we don't have is political professionals working in this field, pushing back on all the garbage horseshit that the Republicans are putting through. I have a meeting in literally 13 minutes with someone who is trying to counter these bills in uh, states on health care, right? This is underfunded. There is no equivalent of, um, you know, right-wing billionaires funding this garbage. Uh, If you're looking for the people pushing back legislatively, you've got Lambda Legal. HRC has never given a flying fuck about trans people. Uh, They'll do the window dressing, but it's ultimately a club for gay men. So there's no public policy process to, like, we can spread that awareness, but we don't have the institutions to bring that awareness into law. And I, I'm just, I'm stunned that so few people see this problem clearly and are working on it. <laughs> I would love to get every single trans person out there that's truly worried about care. Get the fuck off Twitter. Go raise some money. Get involved in your local elections. Call your, your state rep and ask them to support some of these bills that people are trying to get passed. We are so overloaded on one side of the equation. Yeah. And I think that I, so like, I see kind of where the disconnect is. And so like, you're talking about like effectiveness and actually like on the ground and doing it. And I completely agree that we should be having more, like more trans people that are willing to kind of step up and get involved in these conversations and be like, Hey guys, like it's time to start doing shit. I don't disagree with that at all. The way that I'm looking at it is so like, if we have this, this area of political activism where we're trying to get shit done, we're on the ground, we're doing it. But there's also a piece that fits into it where it's like, we don't have to narrativize like the incentive where it's like, we have to get this number down to zero. Even if the number I think for regret was zero or close to zero, which in like most instances, it's pretty fucking low. There would still be people who would say this is like a lifestyle choice that I don't support. I don't want my tax dollars to go to. I don't want to be being taught to my kids, so on and so forth. So like, I agree that there needs to be this broader attempt to get legislation passed, like get the ball moving. But within that, I don't think we have to play that game of like the perfect quota of trans people that don't want to kill themselves and trans people that don't regret getting transition or anything like that. Like, does that make sense where that that piece that I'm kind of focusing on is like, we don't have to play this game of let's get the detransition rate to zero in order to be politically effective. I think that we can do both at the same time. I, I hear what you're saying. I think that's fair. I also think this is a fucking democracy and, you know, political groups have to get by it right black people did it in the civil rights movement women did it when women were getting you know suffrage and the reality is the trans community has treated parents with reasonable questions about oh, their child getting health gender affirming care the message has generally been shut the fuck up which no, i agree the, the messaging is not the by. best yeah I agree right. with you. Uh, the only piece that I'm focusing on is that I don't think that we have to play the the perfect trans person game in order to have that conversation because I agree. I don't think that's it. A I lot think of the people can tell when they're being silenced. So well, yeah. I would agree that like a lot of it, a lot of the messaging is poor. Um, but I would also say that a lot of the messaging is like the loudest people and the most annoying and unhinged people that you can possibly find on Twitter.com. Um, and that's not doing us any favors, obviously. But I would be shocked to believe that like a majority of trans people are you know these fanatical like 
like kill yourself if you don't support your kids people i would say that a, a, a decent chunk of trans people don't believe that unfortunately the ones that are seen are the ones that are happy to scream at people who genuinely are just like hey what's non-binary i don't know what that is and it's like kill yourself like i totally agree that's an issue but i would still consider that to be like more of a messaging issue than like the let's get uh everything in line and all the criteria perfect and make sure the regret rate is as low as possible i think it's like a multifaceted problem of course but i think yeah. that we don't have to play the the let's get the rates down really low in order to like kind of satiate this feral quest to say that being trans is the worst thing that's ever going to happen to you and everybody's going to kill themselves right I, I completely agree with that and look let's assign blame where this needs to be put um you know the the truth is trans twitter is the worst public spokesperson for trans issues you could imagine Trans people have also been forced into the position where fucking trans Twitter is where that conversation has to take place because fucking HRC is not going to step up and put serious money behind a messaging apparatus for trans people to speak for their own fucking dignity. They failed at this for 35 goddamned years and I've been here for every single second of it. I'm really angry about it at this point. You know, like uh, LGBT, the T is silent. Let's just admit it. They've not stood for anyone but themselves. There's not a serious messaging push like there was on gay marriage. And there's no money behind people trying to educate people on basic trans shit. And because of that, we are in this constant reactive war with the fucking right wing, where you've got libs of TikTok putting crazy shit out there, and then trans people on Twitter are countering it. She's amplifying it, and it's leading to the worst possible messaging we can imagine. At some point, we got to have either HRC to wake the fuck up, make this a 50-state mission, invest 10 million 20 million a year in it like stop worrying so much about gay people being able to donate fucking blood and do something for trans people for once like this is it is it is not a twitter problem it's not a messaging problem it is a fucking political leadership problem yeah, I mean, I I don't disagree. Sorry, I, I'm really yeah. angry. If you no, can tell. you're fine. You're fine. I I dabble more in like the the philosophizing side of all I know, that. Where, so I I but totally it's masturbation. I, it doesn't it doesn't get us I, public policy. There's there's plenty of stuff that I do off the internet. You know, I live an entire life off of this little camera right here and i try to keep all of that shit off the internet i drag it up very few and far between but like i mean i don't disagree that like all the stuff that you mentioned is important um it's just like not my wheelhouse um i when i exist on the internet it's for like funds and memes and lols um there's plenty of stuff that i can do and do do outside of you know the internet but this is just kind of my playground at least for the time being but i don't disagree with you and i you know i agree that there needs to be a little bit more momentum with all this kind of shit um i'm just not the one to do it because I, it, it's I mean, not, I, it's not a playground for me. This is my job, and I'm really being honest when I say I think there's not an awareness of how close we are to losing all of it. Access to GRS, access to HRT, not for children, for adults. Uh, access to the public commons, like bathrooms. Um, and this is before you even get to common sense stuff like access to housing. Um, you know, I think, I think one of the consequences, and I've thought about this so much, is there's a lot of reasons to hate Gen X, but a really, really good reason to hate Gen X and geriatric millennials is those trans people transitioned and then just went away and did not lead the way and basically left a whole generation of kids to figure all this stuff out on their own. And I think we are paying the public policy price for that right now. So, um, you know, I, I do have a longer view on this than some people. And I think it's really being underestimated how dire this situation is. So I think for a lot of people, it's tempting to treat this like entertainment. It shouldn't be. These are your rights. This is your access to health care. And I don't know how your trans friends feel, but mine would rather Minecraft themselves than go back to uh, a life without HRT. So this is a problem I think I take very seriously. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I, I completely understand that criticism. And I know that everybody kind of engages with everything in different ways and so on and so forth. I know that like the way that I engage with a lot of stuff is not the way that most people would. And that's fine. Um, obviously, I take that on the chin. There's, you know, better, bigger things that I could be doing instead of playing solitaire, you know, but 
Um, Solitaire is pretty good. It's yeah, it, spark, <laughs> it sparks joy. You know, it's a light in this dark world. But you know, I I do understand the criticisms, and I'm acutely aware of them. It's just not something at the time that I'm interested in. Kind of uh going down the rabbit hole on um maybe you going day. after zenny and poppy is helpful like we got to get these bad actors we've got like one reason we got to this point is we can call out the bad actors in our own communities oh, I and agree. i guess past time to clean house um and i think you served that role and you know this is why i reached out to you a couple of uh, uh about a week ago is to say i really respect you doing that so don't don't discount what you're doing I'm just saying you know, what I find if you're hearing frustration in my voice is because I'm really tired of being attacked by trans people for doing something I think is I don't get paid for doing this. Um, but I think it's really, really needed. I do think we need people that work in this field to step up and help steer the ship a little bit more. Um, this is something I feel like I can contribute and that's the job I'm going to do. And I'd appreciate if people would stop making my job harder. Well, you know, is the nature of the internet. But, you know, I mean, as long as you have your shit in order and you know what's important to you, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. And, I mean, people on Twitter are going to be people on Twitter. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, that's, that, that's never going away. But Fully yeah. agree with them. All right, I got to do a meeting about countering some uh, right-wing legislation. So I'm going to go do that. <laughs> all right, have fun. God bless. Have a good rest of your day. Yep. Later, Gator. I don't think that we need to play by other people's terms. Um, like I said when we were chatting, is like if the the narrative is driven in one direction. Um, I'm trying to think of how I want to phrase this. So like when I think of people fear mongering about transition related care, a lot of it is like this is a huge intervention. Like people are going to regret it. People are going to kill themselves. Like we should really safeguard this because it's a really intense medical decision that people are going to make and blah blah blah. So we have to gatekeep it really hard. Um, it's horrific, like gender affirming surgery is barbaric and blah, 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 like all this shit, right? If I described to you how a hip replacement surgery worked, you would be shocked. Like you would just be absolutely fucking disgusted. Even if I explained to you how like a root canal works, you would just be like, oh my God, that's fucking gross, like horrible. We should legislate this away. People are preying on people's gut reactions to a lot of this stuff, right? Where it's like a, it's like a Ugh, feeling, you know, but like Show me a surgery where you don't get that uh feeling. I don't know if you guys have ever seen liposuction done. That shit will make your tummy hurt. That looks like the most painful shit in the entire world, okay? But like we're preying on these fear responses and this this disgust response, which is what conservatives are doing, basically saying, look at how disgusting and horrific and gross this is, you know, using fresh surgical results or what have you. Um, and the argument that like, well, the problem is, is that we're kind of running rampant. You know, we know that medical transition isn't the right choice for everybody, for which I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, or like, you know, there's a, a, a significant amount of people where medical transition might not be the right choice. I agree with that as well. That's highly uh, likely, you know, it's not a one size fits all. But the obsession with the kind of conformity to these expectations, I think is a mistake where you say like, Oh, well, I don't like trans related stuff because the way that they do the procedure is really disgusting. So instead of talking about that, we say, okay, let's address this. How can we make the procedure look less gross? How can we make the procedure look more palatable to somebody on the outside looking in and say, okay, that's actually not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I think that that's a mistake. I think that's the wrong way to go. Um, in the same sense where if we're talking about, you know, there are some people who regret transition and maybe in your opinion, the criteria is too broad. I don't think it is. Um, instead of looking at that and saying, okay, Okay, we have like on the on like the very liberal end, we have like five percent of people that regret transition or uh, wish that they could go back or detransition or what have you. Um, instead of focusing on that number and getting that number lower, why do we have to play that game? Why can't we just say like, listen, like yeah, with every single intervention, people are going to regret shit. There's people that regret chemotherapy. Uh, there's people that regret getting hip replacements. There's people that regret getting boob jobs. That doesn't mean that we take these things away. And these things are. Uh, safeguarded to a certain extent, right? Like you can't just walk into a boob job clinic and get a boob job the exact same day. There's a process, you got to fill out some paperwork, whatever. And if anything, trans related care is more regulated than that, because you usually have to go through um, insurance, uh, you usually have to have a letter from a, a therapist, no surgeon worth their salt would give you a double mastectomy or bottom surgery without a letter from a surgeon unless they were really hurting for cash, right? So there's a lot of extra gatekeeping that's done here already. It's already baked into the system that we've created. I don't think that we need to play the game of, okay, well, let's worry about the criteria. Let's worry about getting these numbers lower because it's an irrelevant question. Even if the number was zero, even if the number was two people in the history of the universe, people would still be asked mad about it. People would still say, no, I don't, I don't think that this is right. I don't think that people should be doing this. I think that we're attacking the wrong 
uh, the wrong thing in that, where it's not about getting the number so low that nobody can criticize it because they'll criticize it anyway. The issue is saying like, listen, this is a medical procedure. This is a psychiatric and physical intervention. There's always going to be regret. There's always going to be, I wish I didn't do this. Like that isn't going to go away. You're never going to get that to zero. It's never going to go away. So why don't we worry about making sure that the people that get access to it are knowing what they're doing. This is a safeguard that's already in place. Why don't we make sure that these people are making informed decisions? People are already making informed decisions. And why don't we make sure that with children, especially that this is more heavily gatekept so they're not making, you know, graver mistakes because it's obviously a bigger mistake for a kid, right? That already exists. It's just... I think that we're just fundamentally misunderstanding um, what we need to be concerned with. Um, And that was my criticism.